Welcome to the Wholesale Elite Podcast. I am Aisham Hipshire, and I'm joined by Tanner Santucci. What up, dude? What's up, dude? This is a good episode, wasn't it? This is a phenomenal episode. <laughs> Guys, if you don't know who Rob Abasalo is, um, he is the co-host of Bigger Pockets, which is the podcast for real estate investors. They're like the the Joe Rogan, if you will, <laughs> of, <laughs> of podcasts in, in our market or in our industry. And so it was really cool to have him on and to, and to get insights from someone who's been in the game for, for quite some time. And man, did we get some insights. Tanner, what was one of your favorite parts about the episode? Yeah, I, I would have to say that a lot of, my favorite part specifically was his story and essentially his first deal. Um, the fact that, again, it's, I think it's been a common theme where a lot of entrepreneurs just take risks and Rob is obviously a proven risk taker. Um, and so I really enjoyed hearing his first Airbnb deal where it was a studio apartment and the fact that he went to his wife and his wife was like, do you know anything about this? And Rob's like, nope, but I'm gonna do it. And then Rob, <laughs> and then Rob figured it out. And so stuff like that, uh, you know, I thought it was tremendous. and. Obviously, Rob's personality and his energy and it speaks for itself and why Bigger Pockets chose him to be the new co-host and all that stuff. And so I think there's a lot of gold nuggets for any investor um, and not just an investor standpoint, but an entrepreneur standpoint and, and getting to listen to it, someone, the risk that they took and how successful that those risks paid off to be. And so I thought it was a phenomenal episode. Absolutely. And guys, you know, whether you're, you know, Rob's really heavy in the short term rentals, right? So, we, you know, we discussed that a little bit here. Um, but even if you're not interested in short term rentals, if, if that's not your game, just understand, you know, what we do in our podcasts is, is we break down the mindset of successful entrepreneurs. And so I really want to climb, I want you to climb into his head and really understand his reasonings, you know, the why behind the what more so. So guys, we're excited to uh, to move forward with this interview. So here it is, Mr. Rob Abasolo. Very Welcome to me. another episode of the Wholesale Elite Podcast. And we got Rob Abasalo on the show today. Rob, what up, man? What is up, man? What an intro. What a great vibe intro. I was dancing the entire time. Maybe we'll release that to the Patreons. Let's do that. Hey, no robot. <laughs> Let's get it out there. It's a fun song, man. It helps with the energy, you know? Yeah. So hey. what are we talking about today? Are we talking about me? Is it my We story? are. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah we, we've turned the, uh, the the camera around, so to speak. And, you know, you're in the hot seat this time. So okay. I hope you're ready. You know? I am. I am sorry. Did I totally derail your intro? Do you no, want to run it back? At all. You want to start beautiful. over? You got to hit the sprinkler, though, if we have to restart. <laughs> all right. You got to do the work. <laughs> Rob, man, we're excited uh, to, to talk to you, obviously. And, and for any one of you who are listening or watching and you don't know uh, who Rob Abasalo is, um, you're probably brand new um, and that's OK. Uh, we love brand new people. And if you're not brand new and you haven't, then, wow, you're, you're in for a treat. So um, if any of you haven't heard of a little tiny podcast uh, called Bigger Pockets, um, Rob is the co-host along with uh, Dave Green. And they do a phenomenal job and have millions and millions of, of downloads. And um, they're the guys in the space. And so we are incredibly honored to have you on, Rob. And on our podcast, man, we really like to uh, to really just go into the mindset more so than anything. We want to we want to learn about your story, uh, what made you, you know, this prolific um, entrepreneur and investor that you are today. And so. Man, I'm I'm honored to have you, dude. And I'd love to get started by really deep diving into your origin story. I know a lot of people ask you, so, hey, how'd you get started? And they give like a, a two minute intro, you know, of their life up to real estate. But I want to go, I want to go deep, man. Oh, I want to know about your family and, and all that stuff. Fantastic. So, all right. So away. it was December 19th of cold 89. Week. It was a cold, 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 cold winter. <laughs> um, I was born. I was born. I came into the world and it, it was a wintry night. And I always say that I'm an 80s baby. You know, a lot of people, they're like, you were only alive in the 80s for 11 days. And I'm like, well, but was I a baby during the 80s? <laughs> that's funny. And that's that's where that argument really fall. The, the wheels fall off the uh, the old bus there. So right. <laughs> uh, born and raised in, in Houston, Texas. And, um, you know, my my parents were actually Mexican immigrants and my dad was a doctor in Mexico. And they both gave that 
life up. Both my mom and dad, they had great jobs, obviously, and they gave up everything to move to America. And so I was, I was born here, but um, it, was, it was always very interesting growing up because my dad, when he moved here, he wasn't actually able to transfer his like doctor's license. And um, he tried, but he just didn't know English and he failed the test. And I think the tests were like very expensive to take, you know, thousand bucks or something like that, which was, you know, back in, you know, the 80s, 90s. That's, that actually is a significant amount of money. It is now. Sure. Right. And so I think he failed that a couple of times. And, you know, there's only so many times he could he could take that risk. So he tried to um, basically work in the medical industry as much as he could and he was a medical assistant and he was an x-ray technician and just as the years went on more and more regulations came and more certifications were needed and he just kept getting pushed out and so it was really interesting right. for me because uh he was making minimum wage like his entire career and so it was really hard for me to see my dad be the smartest person i know but right. making you know five bucks an hour, five twenty five, seven twenty five, whatever it was back then. Sure. And, um, you know, he was always just hustling and grinding and working hard. And my mom ended up getting a good job with AT&T and she ended up working there her whole career. But I say all this because my dad really was a lot of the inspiration for me. He actually, by the end of his career, like a couple years ago, he was like, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm making forty thousand dollars now son like i did it this is the most i've ever made and it was like just such a big milestone for him and you know don't get me wrong i'm very happy that he like was proud of that but i i was always so motivated to be like all right i want you to like not not work i want you and mom to just retire and be done and so now they are both retired and you know i'm able to actually pay them every single month from my real estate, which is really cool. Right. Um, right. So that, that, that's like kind of the the overarching mission. But growing up, I saw he, him do a bunch of different jobs and side hustles. And um, he actually flipped a couple of houses growing up, him and my mom, they would go and they would work on these houses. And I think they would make like a 20 or $30,000 profit. And I saw them have these victories. And then I saw them go to like a real estate auction one time and buy this house in the Heights actually. And uh, they, it was, they bought two and they thought that they had gotten just like the craziest deal, but they, I guess, bought the liens on the house. I don't really remember, but they basically like got this house and invested a ton of money into it. And it just got stripped away from them because of the actual like legalities. And you know, so don't go buy houses at auction unless you know exactly what you're doing. That's kind sure. of like the lesson one. But I saw that and that kind of deflated them from really ever being able to do more. Like, I don't think they ever did real estate ever again after that. Um, so I was always really interested in seeing, like I was interested in real estate and I, I really liked seeing them win and I saw them happy when they had some of those wins and then I saw right. it tear them down when they lost that house. And so I, I always just kind of felt like, you know, one day I'm going to, I'm going to pick up where things uh, left off with them and mm -hmm. I'm going to continue doing that. I knew that real estate was big, you know, even as a kid, I knew it's an important, th it's like a thing that you can make a lot of money at. And so my whole goal is just like one day I'm going to do it. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to live the life that they tried to live themselves for so many years. And again, it was a good life. We were right. fine. Um, we were broke, but they always like provided. Right. We, weren't, we weren't poor. We weren't like living on the street, but we did not have extra money. Right. And um, I remember like one time I came home from school and my mom was crying at the table and I was like, what's wrong? And she was crying because, uh, I had texted my now wife like so many times and like back then you used to pay for like individual text messages oh, yeah. and it was like a four or five hundred dollar charge that that resulted in that bill and so she was just like bawling at the table and so it's kind of moments like that where i was like i'm gonna make sure that this this isn't how their whole life is or whatever mm. so that's kind of like the mm. story behind <laughs> interest and like the the drive and the passion behind real estate is like ultimately i just want to take care of my family absolutely. um and i'm kind of getting there you know absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah you're 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 making waves dude um so what about siblings were you the only child or no no i had two sisters as well and a nephew and um yeah yeah so uh, they were all like one sister was in the military uh and then the other one i think she actually worked as a waitress for like 
for like 20 years or something like that. And now wow. she has like a, somehow she was able to transition that into like a really good job. Um, so yeah, no, I had two siblings and gotcha. yeah, what was, I was the youngest one. I was the one that got beat up and all that stuff by my sister. They would for hold sure. me down. One sister would hold me down and pin my arms up. And then the other sister would tickle me until I cried, tickle <laughs> me until I laughed so hard that I couldn't breathe that I cried. So, um, <laughs> I need to talk. I've been meaning to talk to a therapist about that, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Left and... they apologize. All the time. They're like, oh, we, we weren't mean to you. We know, we know. Uh, What's but yeah, the yeah, age so, gap between you all? Uh, so I am 33. <laughs> you know, you start losing track very quickly after. Sure. 30, I feel like, okay, so I'm 33 and my middle, the next sister up is 39. And then the next sister up is like 41. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, they were stronger than you at the time. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 They were, they were, they were big. They were big. They were, they're much bigger than squatting little me. And then I got in the gym and I worked out every day. So they could yeah. never hold yeah. me back again. Uh, <laughs> and I will never beat up. me up again, sis. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, that's fast. So, okay. So, so it sounds like, you know, you, you, you learned a lot from your dad, you know, from just, uh, for, from his work ethic, from seeing him and his journey and the highs and the lows. And <clears throat> when it comes to work ethic, you know, obviously that's a big part of what we do is, is having that. And I struggled with that for a long time, even though my parents had great work ethic, I was kind of in a similar boat to you where we didn't have a lot of money. Like we didn't do vacations or any of that cool stuff, but we weren't like, you know, you know, eating ramen every night. You know, we had hamburger helper. So hey, we, we were too. And oh, I like yeah, yeah, yeah. They did I was never bummed about it. Like we had, <laughs> we had just enough money to get the beef, like the raw, the ground hey, beef let's go. in the hamburger helper. But there were times we did not have the beef. Oh man, just the cheesy mac with no beef. That's it was just brutal. The cheesy mac. It was like very flavorful <laughs> mac. Sorry, go. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, so so they they did okay. Um, but you know, it, it, it was challenging. Um, and so they always provided though. And you know, I, 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 I wanted to work. Um, so I started working at like 14. Um, but I didn't really feel like I had good work ethic. And it wasn't until I found something that I was really locked into that I figured out, oh, man, I actually I'm not a lazy piece of shit. Like I actually I, I can work. What was your work ethic like growing up? And did you model that from from either of your parents? I don't know. I don't think so. Let's see. Let me think about that. It took a while before my work ethic really kicked. I think the so the first first of all, I wanted a job so bad when I was 14, 15. Like I, I remember walk like I went to one of the main roads in Houston and literally walked for like two or three hours with my best friend. And we went into every single store trying to get a job. And they were all like, sorry, you have to be 18. And we're like, oh, we just couldn't get jobs. But then finally, I got uh, my first job as a busboy at Gringo's, and uh, that lasted about a week. Nice. Um, I quit that. Then I became a to-go person at Papa Do's, and uh, that was okay money, but you know, it was, it was like, whatever. I did that for a couple years, but really where the work ethic really just kicked into high gear is I was working this job, and I wasn't working a ton. I wasn't making a ton either, but someone had told me about this company, this alarm system company was hiring reps. They're like, it's really good money. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So I basically became a door-to-door -door alarm system salesman. And every time I closed a deal, um, I would make 500 bucks in commission. Mm. And uh, I like, I crushed it. Like when I could actually physically, like I could be the person that affected my paycheck. Because like with to-go, I was making like 725 an hour and then I would make a, a buck or two every, you know, every other person like that would just kind of give me a little tip or whatever. Sure. And so that was, it was like not life changing money, but it was like for a senior in high school, that was pretty good, you know? But then when I got this job as an alarm system salesman, I was making $500 a close, man, there, there was weeks where I was closing one a day, sometimes twice a day. And, uh, dude, I remember I got a $2,000 paycheck in high school and I was just like, dude, I am <laughs> flipping rich. And uh, I wish I knew what I did with that money. <laughs> I spent it on some <laughs> stuff. Uh, definitely didn't spend it on on my college tuition. But that was like the first time where I was like, man, if I like actually like do my thing and I can control my paycheck, I can make a lot of money. For and sure. then um, I ended up quitting that and I went to college and, uh, you know, had to appease the parents. Right. They're like, we didn't 
we didn't leave Mexico for you not to go to college. And <laughs> I, I actually, I never actually fought them on that. I wanted to go to college. And right. um, I studied advertising, did advertising, went into the nine to five world. And yeah, I mean, I didn't make a ton of money. Like I th my first starting salary was like 33,500. And then I think it was 40,000. And then I think I moved, was that when I moved to LA? Then I moved to LA and I doubled it. 80 K and I was like, Whoa, I did it. And then I quit that job and went to another one. I think I ended at like 110. So that was really hard because it was like work ethic for sure. You can get promoted and you can like work hard at your nine to five and your corporate job and get right. promoted. But really the only way that you get the big raises in advertising or any job is to quit and go to another company. Mm. And so I think I was just always tired of doing the, I was always tired of looking at glass door, trying to find a new job. And trying to like figure out, okay, I can make more money um, like if I just go to another job. And I was always just looking for new jobs, not because I hated the one that I had. I just wanted money. I was so right. tired of being broke all the time. You know what I mean? Um, right, right. Because for me, I did not have a lot of money. I like I told you, I was making a decent money finally when we moved to California. Me and my wife, she was a teacher though. And after like student loans, which were like a thousand bucks a month and credit card debt at the highest we were ever were in credit card debt was like 20 grand. It was like a thousand dollars a month. And then our mortgage was a thousand dollars back in Kansas City. So uh, we were pretty broke, like my, my wife and I, when we were first getting married, because like after all of our bills, we had like an extra less than a thousand dollars, like around a thousand dollars every single month. We weren't saving. That's just all we had. I feel like right. that's all. <laughs> always in the bank account was like a thousand dollars kind of thing. Um, so yeah, man, I was just so tired of like that grind, the corporate grind of just, oh, I got to work hard and then maybe I'll get promoted. And then even if I do get promoted at the same company, I'm only going to get like a $3,000 raise or something. So I was always looking for new jobs. And towards the end of my advertising career, like I started looking into Airbnb and I was like, oh, man, okay. I, I hear there's this website where you can like list your place online and people will pay you to stay, strangers will pay you to stay at your at your place. And obviously I was at Airbnb, but I was like pitching my wife this idea. She's like, well, are you sure? Like, are you sure it's going to work? And then I was like, um, I'm not sure, but I think I'll figure it out. And she was like, all right, well, let's do it. So we wow. bought a house. There's a little studio apartment under it. We were in LA at this point. That house was $624,000, about four times more than the house that we had just sold. It was very scary, but I was like, there's this, there was this little 279 square foot studio apartment Whew. under that house. And I was like, if we, if we rent that apartment on Airbnb, I think we can make like two or three grand a month. And my wife, again, you know, she, this was our second unit basically. And she's like, are you sure? And I was like, no, definitely not. But I think <laughs> and it, it actually ended up being that way, right? Our mortgage was 4,400 bucks. We had uh, a rental arbitrage going at that time making like one to $2,000 a month. We had that little studio apartment making two to $3,000 a month. And before you know it, I'm not paying my $4,400 mortgage anymore. And the wheels are turning and I'm just like, dang, if I did this like 10 times, I, like, I would make, I'd be making so much money. I could be making like 10 grand a month. Um, so it was actually a really cool moment when that happened because, you know, like I was like, oh, my, my goal, I did it. And yeah, you know, absolutely. Perpetually setting new goals for yourself in this business. Absolutely. Well, okay. So you, so, so you're, you're, you're doing Airbnb. Um, but you know, a lot of times we, we feel like we need coaches or we feel like we need to really learn everything before we go do it. Was, was that your problem at all? Or did you guys just jump right into it? Well, yeah, there were, there were really no coaches, man. Not at that time. I mean, this was before courses. This was really before like the real estate content creators like became a thing on YouTube. I mean, it was 2017. So there yeah. definitely were some people, but certainly there weren't really like that many people, right? Like there was right. no one, you couldn't just go to YouTube and like type in how to automate your Airbnb business. Like you wouldn't have that many results. There might right. be somebody that was like shooting a, a really bad video on their iPhone and it's like crackly audio and stuff like that. But you know, it was just like, right there wasn't a lot of literature out there. So yeah, I tend to just be a risky person and a risk taker. And I'm just like, I'm just going to freaking do it and I'll figure it out. Like I always say, this is my main metaphor is like punching the hole in the wall. I used to do like DIY all the time. And so if I was going to like work on the wall, like if I had to do something like an accent wall or something, 
I'd put it off and off over and over again. So I would just like grab my hammer and just fucking put a, a sorry, I didn't mean to cuss, but no, put a giant yeah. hole in the, uh, okay, a fucking hole in the wall. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then I'd be like, dang it. All right. Hold in the wall. I got to, I got to fix it now. Yeah, right. It. And so if I don't, there's going to be a giant hole in my living room and my wife is going to be very bad at me that I freaking made a hole in the wall. And then I'm going to have to look at it. I'm going to have to explain it to my friends. And so it, it, it basically commits me to have to finish the project. And so that is my mentality with all things, but especially real estate where I was just like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to Airbnb. I heard it's a cool thing. It seems like a great idea. What could go, what could go wrong? I had no idea a lot of things, but I was just like, all right, what could go wrong? And so I listed it and I just learned and I learned and I learned and I learned and I learned. And so, um, yeah, man, I think Airbnb is one of those things where I learned a lot of things the hard way. Um, and it's honestly kind of crazy that I did learn it without, without like, you know, without raw bill, without like sure. being, being able to go to YouTube and be like, let me type this in. And then there's all these people that teach it for free. You know what I mean? Right. So it's always like crazy to me because, you know, the people, they just, people don't know, you know, they don't know what it's like kids. They'll never know a life without internet. And now people that all the hosts that are getting in, they got so much information. I'm really right. jealous for them. But that's, I think what makes me one of the top players in this space is that I just really learned the hard way. And like, sure. nothing is a big deal to me now. Like so much stuff happens all the time. And like, I'll be hanging out with friends and they're like, what's wrong? Or they're like, what, what happened? Like if I'm on my phone, I'm like, oh, you know, someone just like lit my house on fire, but it's fine. And they're like, what? What? Like, oh, Why are no, you so it's calm? fine. Don't worry about it. Um, it happens all the time. Like I, there was a time where the cops came, there's a manhunt because someone oh, wow. thought that someone broke into the house. And I was like, oh man, that's interesting. My, I, my neighbors had come over. It was the first time that they had ever come over. So it was like really solidifying us from like neighbors to friends, right? Like they came over and like, we're drinking wine. And then I'm like on my phone and my wife's like, babe, you're being rude. And I was like, well, sorry, just, there's just this thing. And, and then, um, and we're like, what is it? And I was like, oh, this, there's like a burglar in my house. And then they're like, what? And I was like, no, nah, it's fine. It's probably not. And so like, we're hanging out, we're drinking wine. And then like, you know, I'm like, oh, I got to get this real fast. I'll be right back. And I like went to the room, took the call and it's my assistant. And she's like, hey, cops are there. And I was like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll tell them this and that. I go back into the, the kitchen and like my neighbors are like, well, you have to tell us now. And I was like, oh, it's just <laughs> cops are there now. And they're like, what? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, it's fine. This happens all the time. And uh, we get another phone call. I come back and they're like, what? What happened? And I was like, oh, there's just, there's, they brought the canine unit. There's a manhunt in the force. And they're like, how are you not freaking out? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, same old, same old. It's just another Tuesday on Airbnb for me. <laughs> and that so amounted funny. to nothing, by the way. What happened was that guest Turn, flick the switch that like was like a two-way switch or whatever and like turn on the basement light and then they turned it off really fast because they were like so they creeped themselves out basically oh my and, god uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my so, god yeah it's, and well, it's not the first time that something like that has happened i'll tell you that much but it's uh, i yeah, can imagine so, like so so that that begs the question at least from my perspective is you know um you're you're obviously good now at handling bad news. Um, mm -hmm. Were you were you always that way, or can you think back to the beginning of your Airbnb business where a challenge would would you know come your way? Would you, would you kind of shit your pants and be like, God, like what am I gonna do? Or have you always been this cool, calm, and collected? Like we're we're gonna get through this, no problem. I think it was. Uh, I mean, it was all incremental, right? Like I actually think that I'm a very rare case in that. You know, most people, there are some people that get into real estate, right? And like my parents, like they bought that house at auction and that like stops them from continuing, right? Right. I'm sure there are people in the wholesale world that get into this deal and then it something terrible happens and they're like, dang it, I lost my escrow money on this or whatever. I'm not going to do sure. this again. Or like a skateboarder, right? Like a really good skateboarder that probably could be the next Tony Hawk, but they fell and broke their wrist. And so they never like got back onto it. Right. So that kind of stuff happens to people all the time. For me, I actually felt like all of the things that happened to me were very incremental. Like it was never like, like that story that I just told you, if right. that had happened to me the first year, I would have been like, holy crap, I'm not doing this ever again. 
but it was always just little things that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so like every time a new challenge came, I was just like, all right, that's a new one. Uh, but at least it's not that bad because I just dealt with this thing last week. That's not quite as bad as, as this, sure. but it's pretty, pretty on par. And I kind of feel like I got really lucky with that. So I think uh, not really, dude. I mean, dude, a lot of things have happened in my Airbnb journey and I really don't get, I really don't get shaken all that much these days. Like it's just is what it is, man. You just, you got to figure, you got to remember like the main question that you have to ask yourself as a, as a Airbnb host and honestly, just as a real estate investor is who, not how, right? Hmm. Something goes wrong. It's not like, how am I going to fix this? It's who is going to fix this? That's like, that's what all real estate comes down to. And so when everyone's like, wanting to buy a house or get into Airbnb. They're like, well, what about the leaky toilets? Which actually, funny enough, I had a leaky toilet today, but that's not a hero there. <laughs> and um, Handyman is fixing it though. Like, I'm like, great. I'm not going to fly out to Gatlinburg, Tennessee to fix a leaky toilet. I'm going to call sure. my handyman and be like, hey, bro, can you go fix the leaky toilet? Hope there's no surprises in there. And he's like, yeah, sure. And so um, he went and he fixed it. So that's how all real estate is. And like, I had a giant uh leak in my roof one time at my tiny house in joshua tree and i mean it was a bummer and the guest was sending me photos of like freaking water coming out and i was like oh that's you know that's not fun but i was just like all right well i'm not gonna i don't know how to fix a broken pipe or like i don't know how to fix the roof issue or whatever so it doesn't matter like like I, sh I can't really freak out all that much or i can't be like how am i gonna fix it i couldn't fix it even if i tried all i can really do is call the contractor that built the house and say hey there's a big leak in my house. What are we going to do? And then he's gotcha. like, oh, I'll just get my roofer out there, right? So, yeah, I think I'm pretty good at just staying pretty chill now. And I think I always have been because there was always somebody to call to fix the problem. Sure. Do you, do you think that that has – well, let me, let me ask it this way. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure that being at the level of financial you know, status that you're at right now, that certainly helps, you know, because there's – you're, you're not freaking, unless the problem's just massive, you know, but mm -hmm, you're not mm -hmm. freaking out about leaky toilets and things like that because, you know, income wise, it's not really that big of a deal. Whereas back in the day that, that may have presented a problem. So for anyone who's, who's in that realm right now of, man, I can't wait till I can be cool and calm like Rob. But right now, man, when I got the, the text for my leaky roof, like that sucks. Like what kind of insight or, or advice do you have for those people? I mean, dude, that, that kind of stuff was happening even at the beginning. I mean, you have to have your reserves. And that was something that, truthfully, I didn't really know or think about back then, right? Like, I just got into this. I'm like, I'm going to figure it out. Every single time I've ever done something in real estate, I just kind of did it. And I didn't, right. like, sit down and say, all right, well, I have six months reserves and blah, blah, blah. Right. If you're a good real estate investor and you're taking advice, do as I say, not as I do. And what I'm about to <laughs> say is make sure you get into any investment with, like, some level of reserves mm. for like, you know, any kind of repair, massive repair, right? Like, and that is why you want to save money for CapEx and you, capital expenditures. And that's why you want to save money for routine maintenance and stuff like that. Because especially now, like, well, I'll tell you this, um, this sort of isn't the best advice, but it's also not the worst advice. And I'm proud of that. But um, <laughs> I don't spend any of my real estate money. I never have. I never will. Like, all of the money I've ever made from Airbnb has been completely reinvested into something else. So like I've never had like hmm. 25 grand in my Airbnb account and then been like, all right, what am I going to do? I guess I could just uh, go buy some cool shoes, I guess. It's just like that just goes back into the into the to the mix. So I actually kind of give that advice to all of my students where I'm like, look. I know we're doing this because we want to make quote unquote passive income and cash flow and quit our nine to five jobs, but don't figure out how to make right. other monies outside of real estate. Like save your money, save, save uh, every single dollar you ever make and then keep putting it back into real estate. Cause if you do that five times, it starts compounding. And then if you do that 10 times, then you can look back and be like, Whoa, I'm making 25 grand a month. But if you're always like spending your money and like distributing money to yourself, then yeah, like you won't have the reserves or anything to like fix catastrophic things. And so for me, I just always let my Airbnb like bank accounts like build up. I think I've got like 25 grand in one right now and 30 grand. Another that I literally is just like, I just haven't moved it to like an investment or whatever. But right. I think the insight is like never treat real estate money as yours. 
say it, it's future use money. And so just keep putting it away and keep like keep your reserve so that when stuff happens, you can pull from it. And it's like not a big deal because it's not your money anyways. I see. Hmm. Awesome. Awesome insight, dude. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> Rob, what would you say? What, what's a unique skill um, that you personally you know, have um, and, and how does that benefit your business? What is a unique skill that I have? What is your greatest strength and your greatest weakness? Right. Um, I love <laughs> too much. You know, I think I'm too, I'm a lover. Um, <laughs> I'm a lover I care too much about people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, let's see. I mean, I, I've always been pretty good at knowing what a property is going to make based off of gut feel. Um, okay. But the reason that it that it comes from the gut is because I've analyzed like tens of thousands of houses. Like, you know, when I was first getting started in Airbnb, all I was doing was freaking comping and analyzing and running comparables and going onto air DNA and going to people's calendars and calculating it. So doing it thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, I'm just good at walking into a place and be like, this is going to make 80 grand. And, um, uh it's not super often that I'm wrong. I am sometimes, but for the most part, like I have a pretty good idea of what something is going to make. So I always like kind of guess. And then like when I'm making offer on a house, I'll kind of like run very preliminary comps just based on what I know. And then right. if I get into escrow, then I'll spend the time doing a deep dive into the analytics and like how much is it going to make and this and that. Cause you know, if it doesn't end up working out, I could just walk away from the, from the contract or whatever. But like I just bought a house in, um, put a house, an offer on a million dollar house in Colorado. It's this like triple dome, like crazy home. And it was actually on Zillow gone wild. And I just made an offer. Nice. I didn't even analyze it. I didn't even put it into air DNA. I was just like, that's my house. I'm going to get it. And so I made an offer on it. And the realtor was like, man, that's so cool. Like, this is a great house. What do you think it's going to make? I was like, I have no idea. I'll check tomorrow. And then she was like, you didn't even look. I was like, no, I, <laughs> I know it's a winner. Um, right. Wow. And so, you know, now I've analyzed it and, uh, it's actually going to lose money. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, now I've analyzed it <laughs> and it, 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 it has the potential to make decent money. I think, um, on the, in the worst case scenario, I mean, I guess worst case scenario is like it loses money, but really like, in the more realistic worst case scenario, it'll break even cool with that. I actually don't necessarily need to make a ton of money from the property. Cause I get like cost segregations and depreciation and stuff, but on the high end, I'll make like a hundred grand a year on it. Sick. I'm pretty happy with that. You know what yeah. I mean? So I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm good with whatever in between there is. Wow. Um, I actually think it'll probably make a profit of, I'm going to say like 70 K 70 to 80 K is, is like what I think the profit will be. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Uh, if, sure. if I make 20 K, I'm also cool with it because it's an amazing house. It's very inspiring. It's going to create really great content for me and it'll save me tens of thousands of dollars in taxes. So I'm all good there. Dude, well, we got to plan awesome. a trip there for, for our team next year. Yeah, yeah <laughs> dude, wanna... it's sick. We're at in Colorado. Uh, it's in Castle Rock, so it's right outside of uh, of Denver, maybe like 15 to 30 minutes. Oh, for sure, dude. We'll definitely connect on that. Yeah. I'll I'll ask, okay, you. so you've got a big, you know, obviously you got a big presence. A lot of people know you. I'm sure you get a lot of arrows shot at you. Is oh, there yeah. is there a criticism or an insult that you hear about yourself that you actually see as one of your greatest strengths? Um, I would say probably that I make uh my like a, a good part of my livelihood is that I sell courses that I have a program that teaches people how to start an Airbnb business and um, you know, people are always like, yeah, you make you make money on courses. I'm like, okay, you're welcome. You're welcome for I was like they always like get mad that I make money on courses, but that but like they completely just disregard all of the amazing free content that I put on YouTube. I'm like, you sure. could just watch the channel for free if you want to. If you would like to learn more, I spend a lot more time like in my program, like working with students, putting together materials, teaching people. I've got like eighteen hundred students that are all making more money than me, that are all crushing it more than me. They have way cooler homes. So like people really try to bring me down for that. But I'm like, yeah, I mean, you're, you're mad that I'm good at what I do. I'm so good at something that like people trust me to teach them that that's actually kind of like, it's a very cool thing. Sure. I'm so honored to be in, in the business that I'm, I'm so honored that I have students that are willing to invest both in me and in themselves. Right. And I'm like, that's actually a really cool thing. And they love it. Like 
uh, all these haters. Sometimes I want to be like, here, look, I'll give it to you for free. And then you have to come back and apologize on YouTube for the meme. Right. That you me. <laughs> <laughs> That's gold. Oh my God. Please do that. <laughs> oh man. Well, dude. Um, so look, look at it in the future, you know, it's still, still a new year. Um, what, what are some things that you're concerned about and then also excited about? Yeah, I think the, um, the years of the casual host is kind of over. So mm. I think Airbnb was very easy for a long time. Like I think you could get an Airbnb, you could get an apartment, you can get a home, you could throw a bed in there and you can make thousands of bucks. Like that's how it was for a long time. Problem is when everybody starts doing that, then everyone's got to kind of step their game up a little bit. Right. And the, sure. the competition keeps going higher and higher. So a lot of people are always talking about the Airbnb bust or whatever, um, which is sort of like, all these Airbnbs that are going out of business because it's just people that never stepped up their game according to the competition. And so unfortunately there are a lot of people that are failing right now and it's not because they can't make more money. It's just because they're not good at this. Like there, there was right. a long time where you could be bad at this and like make a lot of money, but now you kind of have to be good because of the amount of competition. So I'm definitely concerned with a lot of people that still have that mentality. And, you know, hopefully through my channel, I try to educate them on how to run a relatively good short-term rental business and um, how to do it, right? Like I, I run all the numbers with people. I talk about best practices and how to automate your business. And so I already preach that gospel, if you will. Um, but unfortunately, like I am really good at Airbnb. And so when I talk about Airbnb, the goal is to make it feel obtainable and like doable for everybody watching it. Right. And so unfortunately, there are some people that might watch my content and be like, oh, my God, it's easy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just I'm just going to do what Rob said and then do it. And then they end up not being good at it. Right. right. Like they, it's just not meant for them. And so they may not ever actually impl like they're like, oh, Rob is like putting out good content. Seems pretty easy. I'm going to do it. They buy the Airbnb. They don't actually do all the stuff that I talk about because in their mind, it's easy. Right. And right. I'll do all that stuff later. And then right. they may not make money. Right. Or they may lose money because they didn't set up their, their listings properly. So I think in 2023, more than ever, it is the year for, for the unique and the creative host. And the mm -hmm. casual host is going to basically be pushed out of this market. So what I'm really excited about is the, um, the world of direct bookings. Uh, I am just created my, my direct booking website. It's called uh, Neek Sleeps, N-E-E-K Sleeps like a play on unique basically. And okay. I'm really just going to be doing primarily unique homes. Like that dome I bought is a unique stay. And I really, it's, it's very special. And all of the houses that I buy, I want to have some kind of cool element or draw to it. Right. And so sure. um, I think direct bookings are going to be a really big thing for me. I'm really excited to finally like use my audience in a way that like, instead of just teaching them, I can be like, Hey, do you want to, Say at my properties, go to neeksleeps.com and like have one link to send people to instead of them having to maneuver and find my Airbnb listing and stuff like that. Right, so right. <laughs> um, so I'm excited about that. And I'm just excited about the the lack of competition in a, in some regards because like for sure for a long time, for the past two years, like all the all the houses that you wanted would be like 50 to 100 K over asking. Yep. People were getting cocky with their like offers and like interest rates were low and now interest rates are really high. And so that scares a lot of people and the returns are not as good. They really aren't. So for people that were just like, Oh man, I want to make a ton of money. Now they're not going to make that much. They're going to make less because of interest rates. And so they're like, man, I don't know if I want to do this. Right. So I actually kind of see interest rates as a decent thing right now because it is softening the markets quite a bit and like you can finally make an offer maybe under asking maybe you can make an offensive offer as i call it and still get accepted right. um so i actually think it's a good opportunity for the vets to step back in and like not because right like a couple years ago the vets were up against the rookies everyone's kind of going for this gold rush right now all the rookies are scared to get in because the interest rates are high all the vets that are fine with lower returns are like great like Sounds good. I'll just buy this house. And instead of making a 20% return, I'll make a 12% return. Not mm -hmm. a big deal. Like that, that's going to be a better return than what you're going to get in most other asset classes in real estate anyway. For so, sure. um, 
yeah, I'm generally excited about prices falling and um, competition being less. I think it's going to open up the 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 world for me to get a lot more real estate at a lot cheaper prices and be able to get into more properties uh, using creative financing too. Absolutely. Well, this is a this is a question more or less for the the haters you had in your comment section with your since you're a coach and whatnot. But mm -hmm. I guess this is some free tips that you could give. And I know you had mentioned just a second ago on, you know, that hosts need to be a little more creative now. Um, they need mm -hmm. to step their game up. So what other than exotic homes that are a million dollars or, you know, that most hosts maybe don't can't afford, what are some small tips or tricks that Airbnb hosts can use to step up their game? Like you were saying. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, uh, doing really simple, like investing in good furniture, right? Like the first Airbnb that I ever had was, uh, you know, all furnished from Craigslist or let go. And I think I spent like two or three grand on it. And it was bad, man. It was really, really, really bad. And a lot of people are still trying to do that. <laughs> so like, unfortunately you do have to spend money on furniture. And when you do spend that money on furniture, you want to spend it on good furniture. I have a phrase it's buy nice, not thrice, right? Like you don't want to just mm. buy your furniture and then you're gonna have to rebuy it again. And then on the third time is when you're finally like, all right, I'm going to get the nice one. And it's like, you <laughs> should have just bought the nice one from the beginning with it. You would have right. saved a lot more money that way. So I think between having nicer furniture and professional photography, those two things alone can go a, a long way. But there are a lot of people that are like iPhone photographers and they're like, my iPhone is 1000 megapixels. I can do this myself. <laughs> I don't need to spend $200 on a photographer because I am an artiste. And uh, they look bad and they don't make money. And so like people will be like, will you review my listing? And they're like, I'm not making any money. I don't understand why. And then I'll open it up. I'm like, oh, I, I know why. Because you took the photos on a Polaroid camera. These are bad. <laughs> Go spend two, three, four, five hundred bucks on professional photography and you're going to make more money. And most of the time, that small change can make you a lot more money. So I think just being creative with your interior design as well, like that, that's a pretty big one. But spend money on good furniture. Be creative with your interior design. Try not to look like all of the different Airbnbs on, in your neighborhood. Otherwise, why would someone choose you over your competition? Hmm. For sure. With, with with the direct booking link, that that's pretty interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, it's great because you know you're you're siphoning your own leads. You know, um, however, you know, a lot of people don't know about Neek Sleeps just yet. Mm -hmm. um, what's your plan to get the more people to to think Neek Sleeps versus Airbnb? Um, yeah. So you know, you know what the number one thing that people hate about Airbnb right now? Can you guess? Uh, I'd say yeah. the fees. It's the fees. fees it's the fees. Yeah. People hate the fees, man. So, you know, when you when you're putting a spin on your direct booking website, like you basically say, hey, cut out all the fees, right? Mm -hmm. That that's a really big marketing angle. Like, hey, book me direct and save on the fees. And I think if you really hammer that home, a lot of people will be like, Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Yes, let's do it. So I'm actually gonna be um really heavying up on social too and creating reels and TikToks that are property specific and then the cta will be like save on fees at neeksleeps.com kind of thing so i actually think direct booking websites are something that anybody can do like really sure. i really think anybody can do it obviously i have a little bit of an advantage but at the same time it's like even my audience my audience are airbnb hosts they're not really the ones that are going out and traveling to airbnbs they're, the, they're trying to learn how to start their own airbnb so i'll definitely get some traction from my audience a little bit but i think most of the um traction i get will actually be from like instagram reels and tiktok mm. that, that's killer dude well man i um i, I know we're, we're kind of coming up on time and, and i've got a million questions um but i, I do want to ask it's kind of the typical stuff, but I like to know this stuff, man, because it's fascinating to me. When I talk to successful real estate entrepreneurs, I love hearing the variance of their answers here. But are you a morning routine kind of guy? No, no, I wish I was. I want to be because I know like so my friend Cody Sanchez posted this tweet like two or three days ago. That was like 99.9% .9 of your problems would be solved by waking up at 545 a.m. And I was like, oh, it's so true. <laughs> it's just so, so true. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not a morning person at all. But yeah, I mean, if you look at 
millionaires, <laughs> like like really successful billionaires, but you look at like very successful real estate mi- millionaires, mm-hmm. they all have one thing in common and they all wake up freaking early and it's annoying. It's like, <laughs> do you really, do we have to do this? I guess I'll do it. Um, I would like to be though. I really would. Like I would like to be able to wake up at five, I guess. It makes me puke <laughs> just thinking about it and go work out, shoot content, like, you know, do all that kind of stuff. And then... Yeah, I just not feel like I just man, I feel like garbage every time I every day. I'm like, oh, why do I feel this way? Uh, well, what, so I'm just I'm not a morning guy. What does a, a day in the life of Rob Abasala look like? Um, so usually wake up around seven thirty to like seven fifty, and then get the kids ready and take them to daycare. Usually back by nine. Usually getting casually making my way up to my desk by ten. And then, yeah, man, it is a lot of uh, reviewing content. Making content is actually not as much as you think. Like I, I bust out a lot of content in batches. So like my editor will fly out from Oklahoma City. That's where he lives. And then we'll shoot like two months worth of YouTube content in like three days. Mm. Um, so we, we'll go back and forth and do edits and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, just managing social media i still manage my own stuff i haven't really like parsed that out or hired anybody to do that kind of stuff um an unbelievable amount of emails which i don't even have my email public anywhere so i'm always like how do people how are people <laughs> finding this uh and then um a lot of host camp management too which is like my airbnb mentorship program and just interacting with students and answering questions on the facebook group and like coaching calls and um a lot of the back end of running that too. I mean, it's a lot of students like the logistics of running like a high, like a high level program like that. They're pretty high. Like I've got a COO, I've got a copywriter that's like near full time. It feels like, and, um, I've got like, a a funnels ad person that's like, you know, not full time, but they work a lot. And then I've got, uh, a designer. I mean, I've got like a, a big team. And so I'm always just kind of like, managing that team and making sure that the program is getting better and like very seamless. Right. understand. Uh, so I try to end my day at like five or six. It's supposed to end at five. It basically ends at six every day. And I'm always like, Oh man, I'm not even done. Oh my God. My wife's like, get downstairs. And I'm like, I'm just, no, it's all, it's, it's so all, hard. it's all dying. <laughs> um, and then my kids go down, um, you know, they're in the, in the house for like two hours. Kids go down, around eight and then my wife and I will just like sit on the couch and I I may have to go to my studio every so often to kind of like wrap up a few little things. Uh, but yeah, my wife and I will like watch a movie or a TV or like, yeah, make love. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was gonna say make dinner. (laughs) Like we'll, we'll make, uh, (laughs) cut that out, cut that out. Um, (laughs) we'll make dinner. Like we'll make the kids dinner before, but if we want something a little bit more, like what we want because you know a lot of times the, ki- the the dinner is modified based on like kid diets and stuff like that sure. but we'll uh we'll make dinner or we'll get takeout and uh we're really bad about takeout we could be a lot better about not spending so money so much money eating out but that's one of the that's one of the luxuries we have and i'm not giving it up yet i don't blame you man that's yeah takeout's where it's at what, yeah uh, what um I'm, I'm just throwing these questions. I got two questions that I'm like dying to ask you. And I, I know we're running close on time, but what is, what's a book um, that, that you refer to more than any other? <laughs> well, this is actually a pretty good uh, inside joke on bigger pockets. Um, I always say the Burr Bible by David Green. It's called Burr. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Sure. Um, and I talk about it all the time on bigger pockets. I'm always like referring people to that book because it's the only book that I've read in like five years. Nice. <laughs> Honestly, it's the best yeah. policy. Yeah. Go. I've got, I've got ADHD, man. So like, I w- look, th- look, if you were like, Hey man, do you know how your life could be a lot better? And I'm like, Oh yeah, of course. All I have to do is like wake up early, work out every day and read books. And like my life would be completely different. I know that <laughs> the keys to becoming a billionaire, that's it. If I just did those three things, I'd be like, I'd be good to go. But, um, when I read books, man, like I got to read a page like three or four times to move on. I, yeah, I have really, really bad ADHD. So totally relatable. that's why I'm very much a, um, 
TV content, YouTube kind of guy. Like when I'm trying to learn the answer to something, I 100% of the time go to YouTube and, and look it up. Like I think yesterday I was trying to figure out how to start an LLC in Texas. And uh, I went to YouTube and I was like, how to start LLC in Texas. Cause I was like, I'm not about to go and read online how to do this or whatever. So <laughs> it's kind of funny the things that I find myself like YouTubing <laughs> just to like learn because I, it's honestly pretty often. That's it's comforting to hear a guy at your levels YouTubing that. That's that's like okay, good, good, good. Like we're oh we're, yeah, dude. We're doing fine. I love YouTube, man. YouTube's my jam. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in on. I mean, obviously, like I'm here. I I'm here because of YouTube. So I gotta sure. you know, I gotta sh show a little love to other creators. Absolutely. Well, dude, my my last question. It, well, it's probably second to the last question, but bigger pocket pockets. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the top real estate um, podcast. Um, how did that happen? How did you get on the show? What, what how'd that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, it's a funny story. So like my, my life goal, like, you know, when I was in getting started in real estate, like I listened to, um, to bigger pockets, like all the time. And, uh, that, I mean, that's like the, Hey, I listened to bigger pockets and anytime they had a short term rental episode on, I was like, Oh my gosh, like <laughs> I would listen to it and re-listen to it. So my whole real estate goal was just to get on the bigger pockets podcast. You know what I mean? Like to, as a guest, like I'm like, for sure, if I could become a guest for the bigger pockets podcast, life will, will be complete. I'll be done. Um, and so about, I want to say a year and a half ago. Yeah. About a year and a half ago, maybe two years, we'll say two years. They reached out and they were like, uh, do you want to be a guest on the show? And I was like, Oh my gosh, I did it. And, uh, <laughs> I remember I, did the show. I had all these things planned out. I knew what I was going to say. I was like, I'm going to say this and Brandon's going to ask me about this. And then David's going to ask me about this and I'm going to crush it. And then they're going to want to be friends. <laughs> um, and like, it went nothing. Like I thought, like I, I was so bummed. I was like, this <laughs> video, this sucked. I'm not good at this. And I, I'm embarrassed by this. And so I remember just being like really bummed, you know, I was like, I was like, man, that's, that was like, that sucked. That really did suck. And so, um, I was like, whatever. I mean, maybe, maybe they'll have me on one day if they don't think that I sucked as bad as I did. So, um, episode comes out about a month later and all of a sudden I get like all these followers and like a lot of friends reaching out and tagging me on Instagram. Tony Robinson, who's on the real estate rookie text me. He was like, dude, I just heard your episode. It was amazing, man. You crushed it. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, like, no what? way. Really? You mean that? Um, <laughs> So I was just like, man, okay. So that one actually ended up being a pretty popular episode. And I guess like when Brandon was sort of starting to, to phase out or whatever, they started looking for other like fill-ins or whatever. So around that time, they were thinking about launching a different show and we were kind of talking through that and um, just didn't hear from them. So I was like, okay, I guess it's not going to work out or whatever. But then uh, about, yeah, I don't know, maybe about a month after that, they they reached out and um, they were like, well, okay, I'm not going to hold on. I'm, I'm not going to spoil that part yet. So at the same time as the initial talks of maybe starting this other podcast with them in their network, I was actually shooting an HDTV pilot and uh, mm -hmm. I was actually going to have possibly a, a TV show on HDTV. So we're working through all that. It's a slog. It kind of sucks. I wasn't like a super big fan of it. And I was like, man, I don't know. But like, I guess like if I get the show, I'm obviously going to do it. But it's not like, you know, I'm not I'm not as excited about it as I could be. Like, but I had a TV agent and everything. Right. Um, so about a month later after well, I was telling you, like re bigger pockets reaches out and they're like, Hey, yeah. So, would you be interested in taking over for Brandon? And then I was like, uh, "Me? What do you mean? Like for the <laughs> for the Bigger Pockets podcast?" And they're like, "Yeah. Like, would you? Is that something you you would want to do, or did did you want to do the other show?" I was like, "No, no. This one. I want this one. I want the the Bigger Pockets real estate show." And so that was at the same time where HGTV had to make a decision. They passed on the show, but mm. I didn't even care. I actually oh, didn't even want to do the show sure. once the bigger pockets thing came up because I was like, a TV release. show is cool. There's some notoriety there, but honestly, it's just like, I don't know whose life am I going to change 
on a TV show. Like if people recognize me on the street from a show, they'd be like, Hey, you're on that, that show. But like <laughs> bigger pockets is like, you know, cause I had already felt the effect of, of my, what I could do for people, like the, the lives mm-hmm. I could change. Um, I say this as humbly as possible because sure. like I'm a YouTuber and I teach people how to start Airbnbs and people would, re- would reach out and they were like, I started my business because of you. I quit my job because of you. Uh, I left my wife because of you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but they were like, you know, you've changed my life and all this kind. Of, and so I kind of knew, like, wow, like my YouTube channel is is a powerful thing. Bigger Pockets was like my opportunity to triple my platform, and that was way cooler than than a TV show. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I was so happy that the TV show didn't go through, and that they took a chance on me to to you know become the co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. And so. Yeah, I've been doing that for uh, about a year and three months now. So I guess 15 months. And um, it's a dream come true. It's honestly, to say it's a dream come true is really kind of an understatement because it was so far outside of a dream. Like a dream was to go on the show. If you're like, what's your dream? I'm like, oh, it's just to be a guest on the show. And if someone was like, well, would would your dream also be to just be a co-host on the show? I'd be like, why would you ask that? That's a stupid question. That's not possible. Like, no, that's not, that's not my dream. Cause it's not a thing that you can do. Uh, and so now, now I'm the co-host of the show and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's a dream come true, man. That's awesome. It's dude. It's, it's so cool. It's, it's so cool to hear that the, the, the story around that. And then thinking about my own personal journey. And when I first got started, I was listening to bigger pockets and this is, this isn't a long time ago. You know, this is, I, 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 dreamt about getting into real estate 15, 16 years ago when I read the purple Bible, rich dad, poor dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I finally pulled the trigger last year and was, I was in a position where I was able to get in the real estate because my wife's active duty military. So we move around a lot. So I've been wanting to do this, but I'm like, I don't know how the hell to do this virtually. Um, but once I figured that out, went all in and first thing I started doing, you know, podcasts, real estate, Bigger Pockets is the first one. So you and David Green's voice were, were in my head for the, the infancy of my, my business years. And I just listened to so much of you guys. And so, you know, here we are a year and, you know, a year later, I'd say. And you're on our podcast. And mm-hmm. so it's just, it's so cool, bro. You know, I, I, I love hearing this stuff. And thank you so much for everything you sure. poured into the, into the industry, for, for just being your normal self, man. The, the person that you are, that you're showing to us, is the person that I'm sure you are, you know, at, 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 a, at a game or at a PTA conference oh, yeah. or whatever. You're I, I, I do my best. I do my best. I am genuinely one of those people that I would never want to be in the uh, never meet your heroes category. You know what I mean? I'm like, right. what you see, this is it. This is it. Actually, this is a little bit even more um, like this particular podcast is definitely a lot more closer to 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 who I am because, you know, like I like I like going on to other podcasts and like not and just getting to like talk and like talk Shoot about shit, whatever. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, this um, is like this is really, really, really great. Very therapeutic for me because, yeah, usually on podcasts, it's a little bit more professional you know what i mean right, right. And i'm sure that was sort of the intent here but i was like i told you i'm gonna derail this thing no no that you totally <laughs> shit all over our podcast <laughs> it's over we're done redo <laughs> oh shoot we <laughs> haven't been recording this up. whole time dang <laughs> oh i forgot to hit record no we gotta do it all over again <laughs> rob i i've got one last question i don't know if tanner has anything else but dude thank you so much uh for real and in parting you know before we fully land this plan i want to ask you um, and I, I don't want this to sound like I asked this to everyone because I don't, um, but I'm, I'm truly curious for your answer. And that is, how do you measure success? Um, uh, that is a good question. Ne- next, pa- can I pass? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a tough one. It's a tough question. I think it is less money driven these days than one would think. I have monetary goals of like what I want to make like this year, next year. Um, I think success would just be able to like, um, be able to like, I don't know, pay for, make sure that my parents, I guess for me, like I'm going to, I'm trying to get to the point where I can buy my parents a house, give them money, have them sur- survive, um, have all of my expenses and my kids expenses, paid for for the rest of our life and just never have to worry about like 
working for someone else and being happy. I mean, I don't know. I think I kind of have, I think this is it. Like, I think I've done it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm helping people in their journey. Um, a lot of people turn to me for advice and it's a very humbling thing. And a lot of people take that advice and like succeed. And so for me, success, I think at this point is like, I'm, I'm measuring it more in how much success can I create for others Mm. versus like how much more success can I have for myself? Cause I'm good. Like I did it. Like there's not much more that I need, especially from a money standpoint. Like if I made twice as much money, literally nothing about my life changes. Like, you know what mm. I mean? So right. it can't be money, but it can be like helping other people make helping other people feel that way. Like for me, right. I'm like, if I double my income, nothing changes. But for a lot of my audience and a lot of my students, if they double their income, their whole life changes. And so my whole thing is like, how many people can I do that for? And as long as I always have people that are willing to listen to me and like hear me ramble and hear me make weird jokes, like I think that's pretty good. I think I've I think to me that is success that people are willing to come back every week and tune in. Absolutely. What an answer. <laughs> no kidding. I was Bro. working my way through it. I was like, I think this is gonna make sense. And the jury's still out, but <laughs> yeah. I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> no, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> perfect, perfect bow on, on this interview. Uh Tanner, you got anything, man? No, man. I I thought it was great. I didn't say a lot because I was sitting here like a fly on the wall just listening. Um, <laughs> happens yeah, all the time with me. Well, on a podcast, <laughs> if I have someone that's like really good or someone that I really admire, I forget that I'm on the podcast. And then it's like there's like that silence and they're like. And I'm like, oh, right. Yes. Uh, here's another question. Uh, it's Dude. happened a few times. Yeah, that I just listened me. to your uh, your interview with uh, Lewis Howes uh, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh-huh. and that was fat. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard a, a person who wasn't in real estate on the show before. So when I yeah. saw Lewis Howes, I'm like, this is going to be good. You know? Yeah, they, yeah. They're just going to talk greatness and mindset. He, and whatnot. He's a really good example of it where it's just like, he's so good at talking that you're just like, uh-huh. Keep going. <laughs> keep going please don't stop i don't have a question because i just want to keep listening um <laughs> really nice guy i think he is actually speaking at um at the conference that i'm speaking at WealthCon next week so that's, I, i'm sure i'll get to meet him heck yeah that's, that's awesome. awesome well dude rob again thank you so much for your mm-hmm. time and it, it was an honor and a pleasure i'm so glad to uh, to be in relation uh relationship with you uh, you, you're you're obviously a, a giver and someone who Tanner and I love surrounding ourselves with. And again, thank you for your time, man, and for for, for blessing sure. us all with with your yeah, insight. You so, so now you got to send awesome. me a deal. Absolutely, <laughs> we're uh, we're working on that. Right, cool. But <clears throat> in the meantime, how can other people send you deals? How can people work with you? How can people get in touch with you? Just hit me up on the Instagram uh, application. Uh, my handle is Rob Built, R O B U I L T, and uh, you know it's not a. I don't want to brag, but if you were to look next to my handle, there is a little blue badge there because your boy is now finally verified. Hey, it's let's a beautiful, go! Beautiful, you know what's beautiful, funny beautiful is thing. one a fake account I had to report of Rob Built followed me the other day, and so yeah. I was like, oh, here we go. Happens all the happen. time, but now I mean, that big time. Yeah, you, now you, you can go. just look at the the blue badge. So you can right. find me there. But more importantly, find me over on uh, YouTube at Rob Built R O B U I L T. Same same spelling, and I'll teach you how to get started in Airbnb and real estate, and uh, how to deal with like millionaire qualms, and how, how you succeed in the world of scaling up, and everything in between. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, you definitely uh, earn yourself a lot more <laughs> subscribers um, nice. with all of this info you've got. So, dude, thank you so much. I'm a, I don't think I'm subscribed. I, wow. I think Wholesale Lead wow. is, but I don't think I am. Sorry. Nothing hurts more that. than that. There's a little <laughs> dagger in my heart. I'll pull it out I was, once I, I see I always uh... just listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, dude, again, thank you so much, man. And guys, if... We, look, we want to have you right there where Rob's sitting. We want you in the hot seat on the next episode. So go out there, crush it, make it happen, and we will see you on the next episode of the Wholesale League. Peace. And scene. Yes. <laughs> what up, Elite fan? That's a wrap for today's episode. But look, if you got value out of the show today, do us a huge favor and give us a review or give us a like or subscribe. Do all the things to help us get the word out there. And look, we want to see you on the next show. So get out there and crush it, make it happen. Stay tuned for the next episode. Peace.